month-long church-wide campaign, one month to live. Answering the question, what would you do if you had one month to live? Now, we all pray that we have longer than a month to live. We have months, weeks, a bunch of years, whatever the case. You know what? None of us are promised a month. What would you change if you had a month to live? Maybe a lot of you could say, well, you know what? I don't think I'd go to work tomorrow. <coughs> I'm not going back. I'm not going to pay those bills that I've got to pay. There's no reason for me to go to work. Others would say, I'm going to take the trip I've always wanted to take. I'm going to spend time with my family that I've maybe neglected that time. But I think spiritually we begin to make some decisions as well. We have a greater burden for those who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those are God's place in our lives and in our heart. If we have been carrying a burden around that we would be more to be able to share God's love with them. We probably would begin looking at our lives going, you know what, God, I've got a bunt. I'm going to be standing in front of you. I want to make sure I've got everything in line before I stand before you. A lot of different things to think we would do. My question is, why wait? Why wait? Because we may not get a notice that we've got a bunt to live. Why should we wait until the last part of our life to live as God intends us to live our entire journey? Notice what happens or what Jesus speaks in John chapter 10. I believe he tells us some things about how we can make some adjustments within our life. John 10, beginning in verse 7. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, or excuse me, to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance, or have it to the full. Perhaps there's no place that echoes eternity quite like a cemetery. Jennifer says I'm a little weird. I like to go to cemeteries just walk around. Because there's a lot of stories within cemeteries. You look at the dates on cemeteries and you see, first of all, there's a lot of veterans that are there. You think about the service they had for our country. You look at those who lived in the Depression area. area. You look at those who you can't even read the, the dates or hardly the name on the tombstone because they were so long ago. And you begin to wonder, what was their life like? What challenges did they face? Some people put personal information on a tombstone. Make the mother of or the father of, and you may list your kids. If it's a husband and a wife uh, sharing a tombstone together, maybe in the middle there's their wedding date. You may be able to look at that wedding date and on the first one that died, their death date, and see they made 50 or 60 years. An example that they set for future generations. Others may have a scripture verse or an occupation, something that they did. Most people don't put a whole lot of personal information on a tombstone. But all tombstones have three things. There's a date, a dash, and a date. A birth date, a death date, and then a dash that separates those two dates. And I think that what each person's life really comes down to is what transpired between those two dates. Our life comes down to what's in the dash. This morning I want us to think about the dash of our life. Your birth date is known. Your death date is yet to be determined, known by God, but yet to be known by you. What about that dash? You know, living here, there's a lot of cemeteries around that I go to, and it seems like I feel most of them up since I've been here preaching funerals. But it's got a lot of my family members. Some I knew, others I didn't. Camp Grace <coughs> Cemetery, Main Cemetery, Mount Pleasant Cemetery, all those cemeteries have a lot of my family members that are there. And I've heard stories about these folks and some of the, those that I knew, some of those were some of the greatest people that I've ever known, great people of faith. Some were leaders in churches, many were leaders here in this church. Some were business people. Others were people that were very generous with everything they had. Others were elected officials that served this county well many years. But also I know that in the dash of many of those, there's a lot of alcoholics my family and everything that came along with alcoholism and struck, struck them. A lot of drug addicts whose life is known by the dash is known that they were a drug addict. Others were womenizers, adulterers, 
Some were thieves. Some were some of the worst people that a lot of people ever met. You have those in your family as well. Maybe that can be characterized, those things in your dash as well today. See, when we think about it, we don't have control over many things in life. We don't have control of when we're born or where we're born or who our parents are going to be. We don't have control of what season in life or what time period in which we face. We only have control over the dates on our tombstone. Only God knows all those things. Our lives are in His hands. But there's one thing that we have a lot of control over. How are we going to live our dash? Let me ask you that. How do you spend your dash? If your life were to end right now, or you had one month to live, how would your life be characterized? What would people say your life was known by during that birthday and that death day? I'm afraid many of us, rather than living the dash, we dash to live. Because living the dash means that you're impacting the kingdom of God. That you're living your life to glorify God and in service to Him. That you are living your life to make a difference in eternity. You are impacting the lives that are around you. That people who know you, their life is better because they know you. But I think so often we get into we're simply dashing to live. We go to this place and that place and we got to hurry up and knock out this responsibility so that we can get to this chore that's been hanging over our head for a long time. And we've got all these things that are there. And we are simply dashing to live. And if our life were to end in a month, that dash would leave nothing of eternal value with our lives. Over the next four weeks, we're going to begin looking both at home and in our worship services at four principles that we see in Jesus' life. And Jesus knew when He had 30 days to live. We just want to see that Jesus lived passionately, that He loved completely, He learned humbly, and He left boldly. And we're going to look at each one of those things beginning today. When you came in, hopefully you saw all these books scattered around in the foyer and in the hall. I want you to take one of these and begin today, day one, of reading a chapter a day. Some of you are already thinking, that book is thicker than the newspaper. It's thicker than Sports Illustrated. It's thicker than the Hot Rod magazine I have. There is no way. He's crazy. Who thinks I'm reading that? Three to four pages a day. Chapter a day. I was speaking with our ministry and evangelism teams talking about this and the things that we've done this weekend leading up to it. And I said, my challenge is going to be that a husband and a wife read it together. And men, every one of those women in that room laughed. Because you're not fulfilling your responsibility as a spiritual leader of your house. And they thought, there's no way in the world my husband will sit down and read a book with me. Step up to the plate, men. If you had a month to live, you'd probably do it. Take one. So that way, ladies, they don't have an excuse. Hopefully you can share. If not, we have lessons on that at my house most afternoons. We'd be more than welcome for you to join us as we teach our three-year-old to share. But you know, take this book and read it together. If you had a month to live, what would you change? What would you do differently? Today, the reading is about the dash that we look at. I want to examine again this dash. Now I think that a lot of people are unhappy with life because of how they live the dash. If they look at the end of the day and go, I've done nothing that's made a difference. I've done nothing of any value. I've simply put something together all day if you work in an assembly line, or I have fixed something all day, or I've listened to people's problems all day, or I have done whatever it is that you do all day, and you look back and think, I have done nothing of any value. I love John 10.10. 10. The second part of it that we read there, Jesus says, I've come so they may have life and have it in abundance. That's the life that Jesus Christ came for you and I to, to live. That's the life that He died so that you and I could have that life. A life of abundance. Not simply surviving. Not simply to say that we enjoy life, but that we live an abundant life. That's different than dashing to live. Let's look at some principles from this passage. Three of them this morning. Some keys to live in the dash. The first one is to enter the gate. Here Jesus is beginning in all of John 10 to talk about him being the good shepherd and how we are his sheep. Jesus often refers to himself as a shepherd and we are his sheep. A great metaphor that applies to us because of who sheep were. Sheep were very hard-headed animals. I think that fits most of humanity. They did some dumb things. I think that fits all of humanity. 
Sheep had to have someone lead them. You and I need somebody to lead them. <coughs> I think as Jesus looked at the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, he saw the relationship between him and us. There's no better man he could have picked out. And he tells us, and not only is he the sheep, but he says, I am the gate. One of the seven I am statements that Jesus mentions. See, in the desert at night, sheep were often herded into walled enclosures. But either backed up against the cliff, backed up against the mountainside, or maybe at the back of the canyon. And it was a, a natural fence that was there. Now to fence it in, they, they would take boulders and about waist high, would have stacked these boulders on top of another. The sheep could jump on top of those and jump off. So they would take thorns and thistles and other branches and stack them on top of those to make their fence. And it wasn't like this was just your fence. I mean, you graze your sheep, you ended up somewhere else, you would find those, and other people would come in and, and use maybe the one that, that you had created. In such a pen, you would take all of your sheep and you would get them in there, designed for safety, so that they would not become prey to the wild animals. There would be one doorway, one entry in the wall. The shepherd, when he got all the sheep in, would close this entrance either with some more thorns with something there. But most of the time, he would sit down in the gate himself. And it's not fall came. He would stretch out. He would lean his back up against one of the edges. Stretch his feet out. And he was the gate. If any the sheep came close to him, he would sense them. Move them back. If any animals came in on the other side to attack the sheep, he then would scare them off or kill them as well. And the sheep would look they could see their shepherd. Every time they heard a noise, they would look up and they saw their shepherd there in the entryway. They knew everything was okay and they'd go back to sleep. And Jesus takes this image and he states, I am the gate for the sheep. And then he says, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will be kept safe. He is challenging and he is inviting the people to enter into a relationship with him. He also teaches later in John 14, 6 that no man comes to the Father but by me. The only way that we can be reconciled to God, remember, we were His enemies. For a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are enemies to God. The only way that we can be reconciled to Him is through entering the gate. The first step to making your dash count is entering the gate. Accepting Jesus as your Savior and making Him the Lord of your life. That is the reason that you and I were created. We were created to have fellowship with God. And when sin entered into the picture, that fellowship was destroyed. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see the people coming and offering the sacrifices and bringing all the other offerings to appease God, yet none of those reconciled them to God. The only way for it to be completely restored was through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So we sent His Son, because this is the desire of God that all come to know Him. Scripture says He wants no one to perish. He wants no one to spend eternity in hell. So the invitation is enter through the gate. And I love the phrase, whoever, verse 9, whoever enters through me will be saved. That means anybody. Whoever. That means me. That means you. Now remember, Jesus is talking to Pharisees here. They think that you've got to be one of them. They think you've got to be a religious person. That you've got to act according to the law. And you've got to keep all their man-made rituals. All the things that they said, this is what you're supposed to do. If you did all those things, then you got to enter heaven. Then you got to experience the rewards of God. you got to be reconciled to God. And Jesus is saying, no. Whoever. Whoever enters through me will be, not might be, can be, may be, will be saved. Folks, that is a truth that you and I ought to base our life upon and ought to celebrate because the fact that whoever, me and you, can enter into the gate and we will be saved. We've all had the experience of pulling up to a gate and not being able to enter in. There's a few homes around here maybe had that experience. You enter, they've got a gate there and you've got to have a key or a code to get in. But probably for most of us, it's been a gate that had a sign that said posted on it. And you pulled up to this gate, and maybe there was prime fishing behind the gate. Or there was some of the best, looked like some of the best deer hunting or turkey hunting you could see back behind that gate. And it was locked. 
And you thought to yourself, I'm from Calhoun County, that doesn't matter to me. And so you begin to try to figure out how to get around over or under the gate. But let's just all assume today that we're law-abiding citizens, or that you are law-abiding citizens. And you're there. You don't have a key. You don't have a code. You have no way to get into the game. Something that looks so great, something that you want to be a part of, you have to walk away. Always wondering what was it really like on the other side. What Jesus is telling us here is that anybody that comes to Him can be great in You don't have to know the code. You don't have to know the certain regulations. But simply when you have faith in Him and you make Him your Savior, you ask Him to be your Savior and you make Him your Lord, that you are granted entrance into the gate. And when the shepherd was lying at the opening, any noise he heard, he jumped. At least looked up. If he sensed maybe to his left that the, one of the sheep was getting a little close, he would push it back in or was protecting it. Maybe on his right side, he could just sense something was there. Noise. Or just that feeling. He looked up. Maybe he was a wild animal. He would take care of that. He was always ready to respond. And the same is true with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is always drawing people to Himself. And God is constantly desiring to work within each of our lives. <coughs> He wants us to live the dash completely. He wants us to have an abundant life. He desires for us to live a life that impacts those that are around us. He wants us to live a life that impacts His kingdom, that stores up treasures in heaven where nothing or no one can ever take those things away. He's always drawing us. There's always the invitation of Him working within our lives. My greatest experience with Gates been on our mission trips to Chile. This past year, a couple of instances, one time we, we pulled up at a gate, and you know, the car I was driving was about this far off the ground. And we pull up to the gate, the guy gets out, and he opens the gate, and what I can't see is that there's a block about this far off the ground. And so when he does this number, I accelerate. And I get halfway in the gate, and I'm high centered on that block. You know what? Jesus never says, hey, come in, up, oh, stop, you're halfway in. you got to do some other stuff before you can get the rest. Because it took a whole lot of work for us to get all the way in that gate. Instead, his gate swings open widely. And we're allowed to come in and experience everything that comes with going in as a shepherd. Another instance, we pulled up at a house, a nicer house for the area. The gate was there. Our guide gets out, and he starts shaking on the gate, hollering. Now, just moments before, our car has ate my wedding ring. And so the three of us are trying to look for my ring. Now, I want you to picture this. You've got three Americans outside your house, on their knees, digging around in a car, and you've got a guy shaking the gate, and every once in a while, the horn in the car rings their homes. Wouldn't you think you would come out and see what was going on? They didn't. And we kept hollering and kept honking and we kept looking and we would get back up and start the process all over again. Finally, this couple came and they stood at the gate and they talked a little bit with the guy and he turned around and said, they said, come back later. See, when we come to the gate of Jesus Christ, we don't have to do a whole lot of things to get his attention because his eyes are always open, looking for those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And we're told that His ears are always open to the prayers of His people. And there's never a time that when we call out to Him to make Him our Savior and enter to the gate, that He says, no, you wait a little while. Come back another time when it's back. But He always responds to that prayer. His gate hinges or loose. It swings open. And we are allowed in. Today, as we gather here, some of you need to enter the gate. Some of you need to accept Jesus as your Savior and to make Him the Lord of your life. But most of you here have made that decision. 
And you're probably sitting there going, but you get to something that applies to me. I've done that. I live in that part of the dash. Let me ask you, have you gotten over your entrance? Because I think that's one of the reasons why we don't live our dash the way we're supposed to is because we forget everything that God's done in our life. We forget what God has saved us from. We forget how God has redeemed us, how God has changed our life. We forget about everything that comes with having a personal relationship with Him. And we forget that whoever will be saved and that He answered our prayer. He was waiting for us to cry out to Him and He immediately responded to that. And I think we get over the fact that we were allowed entrance into the family of God. So Christian, I want to ask you today, have you gotten over your entrance? Is the reason why your dash is not an abundant life is because you've gotten over everything that God has done for you. The second principle, the second key that we see to live in the dash is we have to ignore the thief. Usually when we talk about the shepherd and the sheep relationship, we worry about those wild animals that would come and devour the sheep, would attack them for food. But there was always the concern of a thief. He would just take a sheep or two most of the time. But if he could get a one or two from me and one or two from somebody else and then the next person before long, he's got a pretty good flock himself. Jesus taught that we come into a relationship with him that nothing can snatch us out of his hand. So here Jesus is not teaching that we enter into the gate and that someone later may steal us. And then there's this constant battle of worried about the thief coming to take us away. Remember the context. Remember who Jesus is talking to. There's those Pharisees. Jesus is calling the Pharisees the thieves. These were the religious leaders who were teaching a message that did not call people to enter to the gate, but rather they were calling them to perform all sorts of religious activity in order to earn the approval and the acceptance of God. Jesus is calling them thieves. Because they're taking away from the gospel and they're telling people just to act accordingly to their ways. And it's easy to get caught up in that today. It's easy to get caught up in the constantly doing religious stuff that we neglect our relationship with the Lord. See, when we come to know Him, we are equipped to serve Him. James says that our works prove our faith. But the thief wants us to focus on our works, not on our relationship. Cemeteries and churches still are full of people whose dash was filled and is filled with lots of religious activity. We would say, well, that was a good person. <clears throat> but all that was done in their own strength for their own personal recognition, not in the power of God. And we have to be on guard against that. Because it's easy for individuals and it's easy for churches to tell people, do all these things you need to be busy. You need to serve. And those things are true. You need to be a servant for the Lord. But it's easy to get so caught up and to get so busy that we say, do these things, and we never put attention on our personal relationship with the Lord. Remember, the Pharisees were quote-unquote good people. And there are times we let good people distract us. All the things that compete for our attention. And we can be racing after them get caught up in the religious activity and we look and we've done nothing in our personal walk with God. As a church, the past few days have been busy. Yesterday, things that we did, things going on today, Paul skin holidays is next week, which by the way, there's nothing religious about that. <coughs> but there's going to be things competing for your attention. Some of you are already made commitments. Some of you have already told me I may not be here next Sunday because I'm going to have a late night Saturday night. Our chili team is going to be involved in this stuff Friday and Saturday. There's some busy times coming up. And what is easy? It's to look and go, boy, I've been doing all these things. I went here and I served and I helped out here because they really needed somebody and they tricked me to serve over here, but it was okay when it was all said and done. And I did all these things. And yet we look back and we've never taken the time to stop down and recognize God, to stop and to recognize God for who He is. We've never taken the time to sit down and open up His Word and say, God, speak to me. And you're sitting here saying, well, you want me to take a book and to read something else? Man, I don't even have time to sit down 
and open up God's Word myself most days. Has the thief got you? See, we need to base our lives on the Word of God. Not any man-made tradition, not any ritual, not anything that somebody else wants us to do. A thief comes and they steal. They steal something that does not belong to them. And when you listen to the thief, they steal your life because it does not belong to them. You were not made for them. Again, we were created for a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when we're serving other things, and we've got all this activity, even religious and good things, and we're always going, always doing, and we're never slowing down to spend time with our relationship with God, we have given our life away. It says the thief comes to steal. Not just to steal, but also to kill and to destroy. Look, see what they to shoot. They may desire to have their own flock, but most of the time they were looking for something to keep themselves. And they would steal a lamb. Then they would kill it. And then what was left, if anything, they would destroy it. So there was no evidence at all. So they eat what they could eat and what they wanted. And then they would burn or bury the rest, dispose of it somehow. Steal, kill, and destroy. Now they can't kill us or destroy us physically. Let me ask you about your spirit. Because as we get caught up and we give our life away to the thief, our lives get to the point where we don't like the batch. We don't like living. We get to the point where we're wore out. We don't have any patience. Our tempers fly. We don't like people. We don't want to be around anybody. Don't ask me to do something else. Time for somebody else to step up, we say. And we see that they have not come and done anything to us physically. But we have given our life away here, or it's been stolen. And they have killed and destroyed our spirit. And we now are just dashing through life rather than living the dash and making a difference. Recently, in Central Arkansas, there was a story on the news of a lady whose home was broken into. She was there alone. And she heard the perpetrator. She grabbed her phone and she went into a closet off of her bathroom where she called 911. They told the police were on their way to stay on the phone. And she could hear her footsteps getting closer and closer to her. The 911 operator told her, you don't have to say anything else. When you need to be quiet, just stay on the line. I can hear you breathing. You're fine. The cops will be there in just a few minutes. They're just blocks away. She told her story and said that she could hear them and could see their, their feet on the other side of the closet door. All she could do was breathe. She was here on the other line. Ma'am, the police are there. They're outside your house. Nothing's going to happen to you. You were safe. They're going to catch these men. Fear the whole time is when they open the door and find her there. She hears the feet turn around and go the other direction. When the perpetrators walk outside, the police were there. They were arrested. This lady told her story about how afraid she was, but yet the comfort that she found through that 911 operator and knowing the presence of the police. See, when the thief comes and tries to steal our life, tries to steal our spirit, to steal our joy. We find our security in the Lord because He's at the gate. He is the gate. And remember that sheep would hear the noise and look up and they would see the sheep there, or the shepherd there. Thank God. He's got us. He's not letting anything happen to us. They lie back down and go to sleep. And if you and I come into the family of God, His protection <coughs> over our lives. We hear noises of the feet. We may see the footsteps. Hear the footsteps, see the feet. And we may feel like we're inside that closet and there is no open door to find us. Yet the whole time we remember that our strength is found in the Lord. That He is our protector. And He is our deliverer. And He came so that we could have a life that was of abundance. And he came so we could have a life that was more than what we often so.
last key to live the dash is we need to bask in the salvation. And I think of the word bask, I think of that old lazy dog on a sunny afternoon, warm sunny afternoon like today, that's laying out in the middle of the yard, away from all the shade and all the trees, his son made it. He doesn't have a concern in the world, he's just being a dog. He's laying there, and you can walk past him, and he may raise his head up, and he's not paying you any attention because he's enjoying every moment of the sun. And the sheep would do that as well. Maybe they'd been laying in a green pasture beside some still waters. They weren't being laid anywhere right away. So the shepherd sat down for a few minutes, and he was enjoying the surroundings. And the sheep would lie down as well, taking in the moment. If we want our dash to leave an impact, then we need to stand, need to understand all that we have in Jesus Christ, and we need to relish, we need to cherish those things. Verse 10 is used regularly by referring to death and actual life. For Jesus later says, John 14, 3, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. The promise of heaven that Jesus is preparing a place for us. And when our life ends, or when He returns, whichever comes first, we're gathered up to Him, and we have a place that He is preparing for us. Folks, that fact should motivate us. It should motivate us to face death without fear, because through Jesus Christ, we know where we are going. And we know that it's a place, not just by happenstance we're getting there, but it's a place where Jesus Christ is preparing for us even today. But this abundant life was not something that was intended for us to experience after death. Rather, it begins instantly upon our relationship with Jesus Christ because God gives our life <coughs> and direction. There should be a marked difference in our life due to the grace of God being poured out upon us. People ought to be able to look at us and see a change that is in our life because of who Jesus Christ is and what He's done. The second part of verse 9, Jesus says, They will come in and go out by pastor. That's a great picture of what happens to us in Jesus Christ. That we get to come in. We enter to the gate. We have a relationship with Him. But then He sends us out. He sends us out to serve the world in which we live. He sends us out to make a difference. He sends us out to live and to leave a legacy with our dash. And then we know at the end of our life that we're invited back into heaven. But then always that He sends us out, that yet we get to come back in for restoration. That He sends us out to serve, and yet we get to come back in for the strength, and the power, and the fellowship that we need with our life. We should bask in who we are in Jesus Christ. That we are a child of God. Not just a child of God, but a friend of God. That through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We're loved. We're secure. That we are accepted. That we have the freedom to approach God. As we talked about, as we came up to Easter, the veil of the temple being torn, that we now have access into the Holy of Holies where we get to come to the very presence of God Himself through Jesus Christ. That we have victory. We sang that song earlier. That's the motto of the child of God. The victory that we have in Jesus. We sing about what's happened in our life since He has come into our heart. The change that should be evident in each one of us. I've talked before about the preacher card. The preacher card is something that may help you every now and then. I found that it helps you when you're on the side of the road with blue lights behind you. If you can just point out your preacher, a lot of times they like to have compassion on you. But all, most of the time it helps in hospitals. This past week I walk in up to the ICU room and I had missed visiting hours. They closed down for lunch. And it's 12 o'clock. And I thought, I don't want to wait an hour, an hour and a half. So I go to the desk and ask an ICU person in the room. 438. Well, so I know. I was late. I missed it. Well, I had to call back and see. So they call back, and here comes out one of the family members. Chit chat for a minute. And then they turn to the receptionist and say, This is our pastor. Can you go back? There was a total change in this lady. Oh, you should have told me you were the preacher. You can go back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Next two days later, I went back and I walked out and said, I'm the preacher of 438. She opens the door and they weren't in there anymore. But you know what? The preacher card. Entrance into things normally you don't get entrance into. It's the privileges that come along the way. I want to ask you, when's the last time you pulled the sheep card? 
When was the last time you realized everything that you have in Jesus Christ and you took advantage of that? When was the last time when Satan began to burden you with your sin and remind you of all the things that you've done in your life? And you pulled out the sheep cards, hey, I've been forgiven. I have a good shepherd. When was the last time that as you sought direction in your life and you were desiring the will of God to come upon your life, did you go, you know what? I've got the one who knows all things. And all power is His. He can give me direction. I'm going to Him. I'm pulling out the sheep card. When was the last time you took advantage of everything that you have in Christ? You know, as I think about leaving the dash, I don't want to leave the legacy of a good guy. Rather, I want to leave the legacy of being a good guy because of who I am in Jesus Christ. I don't want to be known as the preacher. I want to be known as a child of God who is a dem daily demonstration of the grace of God was called to preach the gospel. What about you? How do you want to leave your legacy? How are you living your dash right now? Are you living it with eternity in mind? Being used by God and making a difference for Him? Or are you simply dashing to live? And you look and your life is nothing but one event after another after another. And when your life is over, none of those things will amount to anything. Milton was destined to become one of the most recognized names in the world. Most people don't know his story. You know the saint that he was. He distinguished himself as a successful business entrepreneur. But yet he found himself during the Great Depression with a dilemma on his hands. Machines could do the work of 10 men. They cost less money. Everyone was pressuring him to get the machines to increase the profit. But yet he looked out at the destitution that it would mean for the scores of families in his community. He knew he had the financial means to make a difference. And so the few machines that he had ordered were already installed. He ordered those to be shut down and the ten men hired back to their jobs. The machines that were waiting to be shipped, he was told to send them back. Cancel the order. And he told all the people their jobs were safe. He built houses for many of his employees there in this Pennsylvania town that now bears his name. He created a community that fed and nurtured many children. He built an orphanage later to provide these children with a loving home and with an education, eventually a job. And every time that you buy a Hershey's bar, you buy into Milton's past. Milton Hershey, a saint to those who were not displaced in the Depression by a machine. And a man whose life inspired many to give generously of themselves as he did. He made a difference with his dash. And then we do the same. You may not have the influence and the prestige of Milton Hershey, but all of us have an opportunity to leave Milton Hershey with our dash. I've come so you may have life, Jesus said. And I'm glad you didn't stop there. But to have it in abundance. May we experience the full abundance of the life of Jesus Christ. Bow with me. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I want to ask you Have you entered into the gate? As you search your heart this morning, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And if you can answer that question then with yes, have you gotten over your entrance into the gate? Maybe today you need to begin living your dash by understanding all that you have through Jesus. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Him, I'd love to share with you <coughs> how you can experience His forgiveness. By many to God, you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose three days later. You ask Him, to forgive you and to come be your Savior. And make Him the Lord. Make Him the ruler of your life. Christian, let me ask you, 
as the thief. Stolen and killed and destroyed your spirit. Is there no joy in your life? You've been carrying those burdens around on your own. May we bask in our salvation today. Father, be glorified through our response to your holy word. Lord, may our lives mean more, be known by more than simply two dates. May we make decisions right now in this time of commitment that allow us to impact the world in which we live and to advance your kingdom. Be glorified, I pray, Father, as we respond to your call for our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand together. This morning, Vicky's going to begin to play. I'm just going to ask you to join me prayerfully again this time. We're not going to be staying this morning. If you have a public decision to make this morning, would you come quickly? Maybe you need to come to this altar today. It's open for you to come. Maybe where you're at, you need to respond and call God upon your life.
time for Usher to come forward and we'll continue to worship as we get back to God and part of what He's blessed us with today. <coughs>